So the primary pumps that are keeping the reactor cool um, go down. But um, the steam turbine stops almost immediately. There's no steam, so it just turns itself off and shuts down. Uh, the reactor rods scram, so the rods drop down into the, into the core to <coughs> absorb some of the uh, radiation. Uh, the backup pumps start successfully. The safety valve opens to relieve the pressure. And the light goes on indicating that the, the safety valve is closed. <coughs> and we look at this pressurizer here. So this is a vessel up here that contains the water. So if there's a high enough level here, that means that there's enough water in this entire system to cover the nuclear reactor completely. So if the water level is up here somewhere, the interface between the, the vapor above the water and the water, we'd say, well, there's a lot of water here, so this whole system is full of water, and, and it should be cool. So everything's working all right. So if that were true, somebody might have built a new nuclear reactor in the last four years. That's not true. So what happened? <coughs> so there were isolation valves that were closed around the pumps. So the backup pumps had isolation valves. Now, now that we know reliability, we know why there are isolation valves there, so we can do maintenance on those valves, or on the pumps, so that having water spew all over the place. Those valves are never supposed to be closed in normal operation, but they were. So even though the, pump, the backup pumps came on, no water was circulating. The safety valve remained open in spite of the light. The light went out saying that the safety valve was closed. So there's, there's a problem. The operators are told when the light goes out, the valve is closed. Unfortunately, the light doesn't measure the valve stem position really doesn't measure where the valve is, it just me measures the power going to the valve. So when the power went to the valve, the assumption was that the valve actually closed. The power did go to the valve, but the valve didn't close. The water in the pressurizer is okay, so there's water up here. This is tricky. There's water up here but there's not enough water down in the reactor. How could that happen? Is that it? Higher pressure in the vessel? Well, it's, it's building up pressure here, but why? It's boiling the water. Okay, so in this whole system, this pressurized water system, the reactor's gotten so hot that we're boiling the water. So if we think of, there's a, just think of a big column of water. If I put heat down in the bottom, started to boil the water, what would happen to all of the liquid? It would kind of get pushed up. This vapor would be rising and pushing the water up. So even though it's boiling and there's no water down at the bottom, or not enough water down at the bottom, it's pushing the water up so that there, if there isn't water interface here, but there's no water down here, not sufficient to keep the reactor cool. Very tricky, huh? So the operators were trained, look at this interface, that interface is in the right place, you've got the reactor covered with water. It wasn't true. Okay, so they think there's enough water, so they shut off the makeup water that was coming in here. So we, we don't have any makeup water coming in here. We have a lot of steam leaving here. We're not circulating any water at all, so we're in, we're in a really bad situation. What happens, they have a core meltdown, and that plant never ran again. Okay, so we want to be famous, right? Not infamous. We want to be famous for the so we've got such good engineers. So what do we need to prevent these kinds of incidents? Now things things are gonna go wrong always. Things are gonna go wrong. Uh, and we have to make sure that our system is sometimes we call it robust to these kinds of 
incidents are going to occur. People are going to make mistakes. The equipment is going to break. So how do we how do we make sure that our plants are safe and, and design work well? First of all, there's two steps. One is we have to design the plant properly. So we have to design the plant so that you can monitor everything that's going on. So it's a little surprising after you've taken process control and you say, well, I, I know I have to measure the things I need to control. If you look at a, at a typical chemical process, for everything you control, there are probably four to five other sensors. So if you have 100 control loops, you have 600 or 700 measurements. All those extra measurements are there just for troubleshooting and safety. So we have to be able to monitor it. We also have to have handles. We have to have some way to, if the plant starts to get into a dangerous situation or a situation where there's damaged equipment or release hazardous material, we have to get it back into a safe condition. So that's in the design. Then we have to be able to operate the plant well. Right? So we have to have the capabilities to operate well. Then we have to have the skills to operate the plant well. And what we're going to concentrate on now is the troubleshooting skills. Now once, once we have these skills and we can do, do some examples, we can go back up into the design and say, oh, now I kind of understand what extra I need in the design. And where in your design procedure will you build in all of this troubleshooting? Where will you systematically go through the process and look at it and say, do I need to add this that you covered already? No. <coughs> yeah, exactly. Hazop. So hazop, hazards and operability. Now, when you did the hazop in the safety module, you were taught thinking more about safety. But hazards and operability. So we're going to you go back and do, you, in the hazard, you'd also look for, for all kinds of troubleshooting issues. <coughs> That's where we're going to use this knowledge and make sure that we build it into our individual themselves. So design, operate. So the workshop for a second here. Um, there are, in this Three Mile Island incident, there were some design deficiencies, and then there were some mistakes by the personnel. So you have the two pages that give us this stuff. So take a moment, work with a friend, pretend the person next to you is a friend. Oh, <laughs> oh yes, okay. Uh, take a few minutes and come up with some uh, some design deficiencies and some operations deficiencies in that problem. Okay? Is it clear? Okay, if you have questions, raise your hand and the rest of them will fly to you.
Okay, let's, uh, I know you haven't had time to finish the whole thing, but uh, let's, let's share some ideas. Does anybody have a design issue? There is no way. because it's a big pipe, but what could you put? What kind of sensor would tell you whether the pump's working? Pressure. Okay, so we've got two pumps here. <coughs> so we know now we're going to have valves to isolate these pumps. So this is the backup, let's say. So I could put a pressure sensor there. How would that do? Is that a good place? No, it's a bad place. Why is that a bad place? It's usually closed. Yeah. Well, so, so if these are closed, this pressure will still go up high. So when this turns on, the pressure will go up and I say everything's okay even though there's no flow. So I don't want it here. I want to put the sensor there. So I can actually see that there's a high pressure in the flow system. So what, if I isolate it, I don't want to be tricked. OK, good. So that's <coughs> that we should have that. We should have that. What's another design? Anybody have another design? Yeah. The safety valve indicator only measure the power and not the valve position. Yeah, so, the, so the safety valve light is, is on power. So what could we do? We could, yes? A low cost solution would be to have a, a, cur a curvy visible stem. stem. So that when operators walk in line, they can see if it's open or closed. Okay, so there could be a stem. You could actually measure that stem position and feed it back into the control room. If you need that information quickly, so you could have a read back of the valve position. You could have a temperature sensor at the outlet of the valve. So when the valve shut down, ultimately then the temperature would start to decrease because there wouldn't be steam going out. So there's lots of ways to get some confirming information. And don't design it this way. So is the pump working? This is a common mistake. Well, we'll measure the current, the power going to the pump. And if the power to the pump is on, then the pump's working. That's just the motor. Well, we'll check. We'll see if the, if the rotor's spinning, the, the coupling that's, that's connecting the, the electric motor to the pump. Is it spinning? Then the, then the pump's working. No, because the coupling can break. So you have to make sure that you use a sensor that gives you the information you absolutely need, not some information that's one or two faults away from the information. OK, what about an operations mistake? A, a personal mistake. Yes? What about the fact that I said valves were closed? Yeah, yeah, so that's a big one. That's a huge one, huh? If you close the valves around the, uh, the backup pump, they shouldn't do that. I'm sure there are big signs, don't close these valves. But it happens. That's why we as engineers have to be so careful and thorough in our design. Remember the, in uh, the, the BP Texas City video where that professor said, one person closing a valve should not cause an accident that kills 15 people. So there's a, and, and, 
one thing you have to watch out for is engineers don't always take responsibility for what we do. Surprise. So what happens? We always blame the operator. There's always a human failure. So everybody will concentrate on this mistake over here and forget about all these other mistakes over here. So I attended a presentation by somebody who reviewed the BP Texas City accident for BP, and she implied that it was really the operator's fault when all of those design mistakes have been there for years. So there's all these mistakes, they're latent or contributory factors. They're all latent. They're waiting. They're time bombs waiting for one person to make one mistake, and we're all going to make that mistake sooner or later. So how many times have you looked at the keyboard and hit the wrong key? How could I have missed that key? I mean, but it's going to happen. Okay, so uh, we'll post. I have some some other things here, but we've had uh, a good workshop. We came up with some nice. Uh, I think you understand the issues in here. All right, so we need a systematic way to go about the design and the operations. Now, in design, we're going to, we're going to use our skills in HAZOP to concentrate also on the probability, which we get into that practice. Um, and here we're going to talk more about the operation side, but we'll see what we need. And one of the things I found teaching is that if I start talking about valves and pumps and heat exchangers, everybody goes blank immediately. Right? You know, your eyes are open, but you're thinking about anything else. What could be more boring than a valve? But if we're looking at safety and we're looking at troubleshooting, we're looking at these kinds of real incidents, we can see why we need to know all of that detail. Now, you're not going to learn all the detail here. But it's a, it's a good motivator for when you go out and you work in a pharmaceutical company or uh, uh, a petroleum refinery or wherever you're working to learn the equipment well. Because you really can't do this kind of thorough engineering around the Okay, so we need, a, we need a systematic method. So why should you be interested in this? You do troubleshoot, Google troubleshooting engineering, you get over 31 million hits. And if you actually do that, you find a lot of them are job postings. Almost every job posting includes what kind of skills are they looking for? Troubleshoot. Uh, when you're designing plans, so if you're going to work as a design engineer, most people don't. Most people work in operations because you design the plant once and then you operate it for 40 years. Just think about that. It's a lot more people operating. But if you're doing the design, you must consider these factors over here in your design. If you manage plant operations, remembering that we're not the people who are hands-on operating the plant, but we're managing operators who operate the plant. They're going to be over here. If you want to be a consultant, a high-paid consultant, and make $5,000 a day or whatever consultants make, well, nobody's going to call you until something bad happens. They don't say, hey, everything's working all right. Did you come over? No, I've got to do that. And so troubleshooting is a way to monetize your skills. To monetize your skills. Whatever you sell, you can also sell troubleshooting. Yeah. So people who make pumps and heat exchangers and different kinds of chemical reactors and catalysts all have the troubleshooting business. Okay, from a learning perspective, uh, here's the problem that you've done to death. You've done this so many times, you're consistent. Okay, given the exact information, this is from, for a chemical reactor, information about the flow, the temperature, the feed concentration, so forth, da, 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 da. determine the volume of the reactor. For heat exchangers, here's all the information. I want to get this temperature out. What's the area of heat exchangers? in fluid mechanics. Here's the diameter of the pipe, the pump's here, the vessel's up here, higher. You have all the information, how much work is it for the pump. All of those calculations are very valid, good calculations. 
But if you do them once, you need to look at the principles with a different perspective instead of doing this question a hundred times. So what are the same principles? Given an uncertain set of conditions in the reactor, are the measured values likely? So what would happen if on your final exam with 3K4, somebody gave you that problem instead of that problem? Would you be ready for it? Hopefully you will after this course. If the flow of coolant stopped, what would be the effect on the measured variables? What are the conditions in the reactor that would cause the observed, whatever happens, decrease in conversion? So these are all using the same principles. These problems are harder. These problems are harder. But if you really understand the principle, you should be able to look at the, at, at the system from many different perspectives. So from a learning point of view, for you, doing this a thousand times after you do it once or twice isn't going to help you. But coming back and trying to solve these kinds of problems with the same principles is what's important. So that you really learn the fundamentals. Okay, so that's why you, you should be so excited to have to stay in your seats. Um, so we're going to have a typical kind of problem, and you've had some workshop, a workshop already on this, where you just get some symptom. So who does more troubleshooting than anybody else in the world? What profession? Doctors. They have a huge number, you know, they have fake patients before they get the real patients. They have fake patients come in, and the patient gives them a set of symptoms and then the doctor, the, the, the student doctor, tries to determine what the illness is. So we're going to have a fake patient here, a sick plan. We have to fix this problem, right? <coughs> what we don't want to do is we don't want to guess. It's, it's too important to guess. So we need a systematic method. Okay, can we teach troubleshooting? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. Uh, so it's, ex it's experience and education, both. So hopefully we're going to give you a nice structure that you can use to the end of the course. And, but then more importantly, as you learn uh, the processes that you're going to be working on uh, for the rest of your life. So it's going to be a sy about systematic method, systematic. So you can apply this to the candy factory right next to the Fortinos. Because one, one group of students did the candy factory right next to the Fortinos in this course one year. You can do it for beer and wine and all kinds of other fun processes. We're going to use the same principles and designs. OK, so how are we going to do this? We're going to have this one class, and in the class we're going to follow one problem through, through a number of classes, until we have a great success at the end and diagnose the problem. Hopefully we'll have some time for a couple of additional class exercises, uh, and we'll use the famous uh, tube distillation tower problem for that one. You're going to have on next Monday another set of workshops, try and workshops. And, oh, I've crossed off potential here because I've seen it. There's a question on the final. But you're going to be, you're so happy because you're going to be prepared for it. <laughs> the right amount of money, I'll tell you what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I don't, have you used these, this, these three things here? So, uh, Don Woods, who started this course 40 years ago, really emphasized three things, which I think is very nice. Knowledge, this is what we, we beat into your heads, right? Every, every engineering principle in the world. This is what we spend almost too much time on. Then there's skills. And troubleshooting and communication and all these other professional skills are extremely important. That's how you, you use your knowledge. And then the attitude. What's the, there's going to be an attitude about safety. There's going to be an attitude about troubleshooting. Uh, you want to do a good job, or you want to buy, or I don't really care. And, uh, 
So, so here we want to distinguish normal variation, things are happening all the time, from faults, and we want to be able to find that root cause of the fault and fix it. So the skill is the systematic approach. So we're going to think about whenever we're learning something, it should have a component in each of, three, each of these three categories. And I think for this course it does a lot. Like HAZOP, in, 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 uh, in safety, there was a lot of knowledge, the six layers of safety. There was a HAZOP, was the skill. Right? And the attitude, I think, all you had to do was see the, the, the tape or the video and you changed your attitude. All right, so we're always troubleshooting. You have 30 minutes and your printer won't work. And you have to hand in your 4L2. That's never happened. <laughs> Can we give it orally? No. Uh, so, we're always troubleshooting, always troubleshooting. But now we're going to be a little more systematic. Okay. We're going to build on the, on the problem solving skills. So, you're lucky because you had uh, your master. So, you had the problem solving already in second year. We're going to review that very quickly and we're going to build on that. We're just going to tailor those problem solving steps for the, uh, the troubleshooting. So you're going to be able to adapt to lots and lots of different troubleshooting aspects. So one group in this, this course one year wanted to do a, a bio project, so they did the artificial kidney. And they applied all the principles of this course to the design operation of the kidney. And went over to the, the hospital and, and I got a lot of information. So there's troubleshooting, which involves the patient as well as the uh, caregiver troubleshooting that, that system. So we're troubleshooting everything we need. And so it's very, very broadly. Okay, so here's your here's your famous uh, six step method. Now if you if you Google troubleshooting, you'll find hundreds of troubleshooting methods. From five steps to twelve steps. We're going to use this one if you ultimately in your life find one that has seven steps and you like it better, or eight steps, fine. There's two reasons as we go through this, I'm gonna, I think this is a nice one to use. So we have the engage step, define, explore, diagnose, implement, and look back. So we're gonna start off here when we start to get tense. Somebody comes along and says, what's the problem, right? And your blood pressure goes up. Don't don't faint. <laughs> so we have to we have to deal with that our emotions all the way to where we solve the problem, and then in the look back we prevent that problem from happening again. And so over here in the nuclear plant, how do we prevent all these things from happening again? We have to change our design techniques, our standard designs. We have to document it. We have to train everybody. We have to do something with these valves maybe put an alarm on it. When that stem goes down, it hits a switch, and, and there's a light that goes off in the control room. So whenever that, that block valve is closed, we know it. So we're going to go all the way from, oh my gosh, what's happening, to it's never going to happen again. And it's, it's not a series, it's not a linear method, but we're always going to check that. So when, after we do explore, we're going to go back and look at the define again. Are we, are we, do, we, do we have, do we agree that the, the original definition of the problem is correct? If we do the diagnosis, we start to diagnose, we're going to go back to the define. We're still working on the same problem. Sometimes we have to change the design so we uncover more information. That's okay. And here's how we sort of expand these steps. We're going to expand them into this worksheet. Uh, this uh, worksheet. So in each one of these, so in the final exam, you're expected to have memorized this entire worksheet. No, that's ridiculous. We're not here to memorize. So we don't have to memorize it. This is a, a memory aid so that we can apply our engineering skills. So we don't have to memorize this thing. That's silly. So we're going to go through this and see how we consider all of these issues. But we don't memorize this. Maybe a more to do that. 
<laughs> okay, so one thing that doesn't come out in the troubleshooting technique that's very important, or the problem solving technique, is time. So we have to sort of layer this picture with that circle. Because when something happens, we may have to respond immediately. You know, if this room immediately burst into flames, what would, what would you do? Would you say, well, let's go through and engage first. <laughs> say, no, we got to, I got to get out of here. So we have, there are times we have to respond. There are other times there's a little puddle of water over here, and we don't know where it is, but it might, where's it coming from? So we can use the troubleshooting method for that. So if we start over here, for the current state, we have sort of, I've, I've come up with three categories. Uh, the, the, obviously, there's not just three categories, but this covers most issues. If we can just continue on and solve the problem, and we have plenty of time, and nothing, nobody's going to get hurt, we're not going to damage equipment, we're not going to make a huge amount of off-specification product, then it's not time critical. So we'll go over here, we're going to do our troubleshooting, we're going to implement it, and we're going to get down to the same Now. If it is time critical, we have at least two possibilities. One is we'd like to keep the plant running because it's very expensive to shut it down. It also, shutting down and starting up the plant is the time when most accidents occur. So it actually is kind of unsafe to shut it down and start it up unless we have to. So we'd like to keep it in operation. So what we're going to try and think about is, is there something called a safe park? Can I change the operation of the plant so I can safely park it over here, solve the problem, and then bring it back into normal operation? Now, a, a, a really kind of obvious thing is when the operator made, the operator said, well, I made a change, and all, everything started to go wrong, what's the first thing the operator does? It goes back to where he or she started from. So when you've made it, when there's a change that's occurred and the problem immediately uh, uh, becomes obvious, then you go back. If you're, if you're, if the problem's associated with capacity, plant capacity, it's always easy to reduce the production rate. Try and find a safe part that has a lower production rate. If you don't make as much product, that's okay. It's a short time. We're going to be troubleshooting, then we'll get it back up again. So there's a thing called a safe part. And then there's highly time critical where you have to shut the plant down. So there are times when you're going to damage equipment, if you're in danger of hurting people, you have to hit the big red button. So you lift the little plastic cap and you hit the red button. Now you don't do it, but the operator does it. And make sure you don't do it. I was in a plant once and the plant manager happened to be in the plant when we had a disturbance and the guy panicked. The operators knew what to do, but the plant manager panicked and he went around and he hit all the red buttons. <laughs> and uh, there were reactor furnaces and what happened was they all thermally shocked. We got a huge amount of coke coming off of the, uh, the walls of the reactor and it plugged up all the reactors so we couldn't restart the plant. It took us like a week and a half to restart the plant. And that was that was you know, probably a four to five million dollar mistake. And we could recover from that upset. But he didn't, he wasn't used to being in the control room. I mean, he was the boss, right? So he didn't get fired for doing that. <laughs> if I'd have done that, I would have been out the door. But don't, so it's, it's up to the operators who really, you know, they're, they're like the race car drivers. And we're the ones who are designing the, the race car, the new materials, the right one, methanol, and so forth. So make sure you don't do it. Uh, OK, so we have these three categories. Whenever, and we consider this all the way through the troubleshooting process. We certainly do it in the beginning, but if at any time as we're doing the explore stage, we go, oh my gosh, I just realized you have to shut the plant down and you have to go into the safe park. So 
this doesn't have time in it. It's kind of, it kind of well, we, we leisurely go through these steps. But we have to remember that in the real world, we also have to consider where we are in this, in this uh, three parallel paths. Now, if we shut it down, we have to fix the problem and start it up again to get to this intermediate state. Now, what's the intermediate state? Everything's fixed the best we can. We may have to buy a new heat exchanger, you know, or we may have to change our, our design practices or all kinds of other things before we get to this final state. The final state could be a year down the road, potentially. Uh, but the intermediate state is we can get the plant running and the best it can with the current equipment. So between these two things, are there any questions? It could be what if if a compressor at a high speed starts to vibrate too much, and there are sensors to measure the vibration, then we may reduce the production rate and the speed of the machine, and that that's a safe that would be a safe part. So anything to get away from the incipient fault. So it depends entirely upon the. Uh, so we, may, we, may, we may see that our catalyst is coking too fast, so we're going to just drop the temperature right away. So we're not going to have uh, as high an octane uh, material going into gasoline blending, but we have to fix the problem and then we'll see what So it's, it's, a, it's a very general concept rather than something you, you always take the same stuff. All right, good. Uh, we're going to do the drooping temperature problem. <coughs> the drooping temperature. So we're going to go through all of these stages for the drooping temperature. So here's the, the proper drawing, and you don't have this one. But, and, and this, is a, this isn't even a proper drawing. But now if you look at it, oh, I know why there are two pumps here. I know, oh look, there's a bypasser in the heat. I know that stuff. That's what I, we have a bypasser on a control valve. Uh, so, yeah, it's a bypasser. I know all that stuff now because of reliability and all it does. So, the picture's a little too detailed. So, just for the class, yeah, so the, the picture in the, in the book is that one. But just for the class, we're going to keep the picture simple. So, we have a very simple process. We have a raw material. It's pumped through the fire heater. So this is a fire heater. And to heat the material up, it goes through a packed bed reactor, it gets cooled down, and we put it into the product tank. Then maybe some way that. Okay, so the fire heater, there's a flame here. So we're mixing air and fuel. There's a flame here. It could be lots of burners, could be a single individual burn. It could be on the floor, on the walls, all kinds of different designs. So this radi radiation and uh, convective heat transfer here, and then as the flue gas leaves, it's still hot. So we have some extra heat exchange up here, which has no radiation, just convection. So we have some kind of like, you can think of this as a preheat exchanger, and then the second heat exchange here. So we're, med we're, we're mixing the fuel oil in the air in the burner, we have a flame, out goes the flue gas. We're controlling the temperature with the fuel oil flow rate. Um, we control the feed rate over here, and we control the air flow here. So this is this little diagram is like a it's like a butterfly because we don't want when we compress something we don't want to have a we waste a lot of pressure drop with a, a low valve. So we're going to use something that's like a little damper. So that's the process. Any quick questions on that? Let's look at the scenario. Okay, you're working in your first job, in which you're responsible for that chemical process. Good news, the market for your product has been increasing. During the morning meeting, by the way, morning meetings occur around seven o'clock, so when you work at a plant, that means you've got to be there at seven o'clock every morning. 
that you want to do design. Mm -hmm. So that's where everybody gets together and we say, oh, we're going to do some welding over here and, and can I do that? Is there anything else going on? So every morning you have to have that kind of work. Uh, you have asked the operator to slowly increase the fee flow rate. And the operators are smart, they're not going to do anything fast. In addition, the maintenance group will be calibrating all flow meters. In the afternoon, you're visiting the control room to check on the instrumentation maintenance. The technicians have completed two sensors and are taking a break. Okay. Well, that's good. I did, did two before the break. Anyway. The operator notes that the plant changed feed tanks recently. Okay, so I only show one feed tank in the picture, but there are multiple feed tanks. One of the outside operators, so some operators have sort of been in the centralized control room and others are walking around the equipment, uh, has reported an unusual smell around the feed pump. The control room operator asks for your assistance. She shows you the trend of the data in the figure, which we'll see in a minute. It doesn't look usual to you. She doesn't like it. She believes that it's caused by an improper behavior of the stack down. Okay, so we're going to work on this treatment temperature now. So here's some, some trend data. So we see that the operator has been increasing the feed rate. So the operator's been increasing the feed rate, as you have, because you're selling, you're selling more product. And at this point, something kind of strange occurs. We're not sure if it's a problem yet, but it's got our attention. The temperatures started to fall and the fuel flow rate started to go up. Now the stack damper is this thing. This is what the operator thinks the problem is. This is like in your fireplace. There's a little, uh, yeah, a little butterfly. Now. So we have these three control variables. And so this is the beginning of the, of the uh, grouping temperature problem. So let's go through. Now what's the first thing we do? We don't do? We don't get. We don't get. So again, first of all, we have to manage our stress. So we're up here in the engagement. So this is important. So and almost what's and Dr. Woods approach, he starts with emotions, which is a very good place to start. Because if you're panicking, you're not going to do a very good job. And, and that's one of the things I like about his approach. So quick, what's the problem? Okay, so pumps cavitating, reactors leaking, aliens. <laughs> you're not going to get full credit on the final exam your final answer is the aliens have landed. This is not going to work. You might get partial credit. <laughs> no, no, partial credit. <laughs> Minus one for you know, why is it All right. So we have to we have to control our emotions. Uh, so don't guess. Don't get panicked. So some attitudes that are not helpful, blame somebody else. Unfortunately, this often happens. Uh, and, and so, especially in the middle of a, a problem solving a problem, it's not a good thing. <coughs> no, I don't understand. I'd better do something fast. So, when I was in the army, people would say, "Don't just stand there, do something." To me, that meant getting shot. You know? <laughs> I don't want to do anything until I know what I'm doing. Especially, in the army. so don't think that I have to. You have to do something. If you recognize it's a safety problem, then you have to do something fast. But that should be already thought out. And the procedure should be there, and the control system should be there, so when you hit the red button, everything happens automatically and fast. So do something fast only if you're absolutely sure that it's a safety problem. <coughs> Other than that, we're going to we're gonna make her. Don't run. <laughs> Good for your career. So I have no confidence. <coughs> Don't worry about that. Okay, what are we gonna do? You gotta make sure that you consider the problem carefully. Go back over the initial information. Do not expect the answer to be obvious, but sometimes the answer is obvious. Then we don't have to go through all this troubleshooting procedure, but 
we get paid for the things that are not obvious. But you can get a Waterloo engineer to do the obvious stuff. It's the master engineers. It's all the toughness. <coughs> okay, work with others. Make sure you're engaged. Make sure you're working with others. In Fukushima, the, the, if you go through the history of that, that terrible incident, the, engineer, the engineers and the operators were very innovative, working as a team, trying to keep the, the, the nuclear plant from having a meltdown. They were not successful because they were just overwhelmed. But they went to the point of taking batteries out of their cars and bringing them in and starting some instrumentation of the power of all of their powers. Their batteries went down. They were really working as a team to a marvelous job. Uh, use a troubleshooting method that's standard. You know, what you'll find is usually companies have some training programs and it's really helpful to have the entire group using the same method. It's extremely helpful. And remember, principles always apply. Okay, so we're feeling good about ourselves. I want to when I can. Now, in the define stage, there's lots of stuff going on. Now we have to define the problem. So I definitely want to draw a sketch and note the key variables if, if, if you don't have to. The first thing you do is try and find piping and instrumentation drawings. Um, oh, that's up. Sorry. That's up. All right, so. Uh, Nobody wants to leave. You don't want to leave. Let's go the room. <laughs> Next class, we will continue on with the drooping temperature problem until we solve it. <laughs>